Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. All right, welcome to Eco Ask Why. Very excited for this episode. We're going to be digging into the topic of what is a soft starter and how can I best apply them in my facility. So with us today, we have uh, Mr. Chase Belke from Siemens. Very excited Good to have morning. Chase. So welcome, Chase. Thank you. So just uh, to kind of get us started, can you give us a, a, a basic general back breakdown of what a soft starter is? Yeah, sure. So... Um... Basically, there's three types of ways to get a motor moving in today's industry. Um, You've got a starter, which is just a contactor and some overloads and line protection. Then you've got a soft starter, and then you've got a drive. What a soft starter does is it always runs at the main speed of the motor. So if you have an 1,800 RPM motor, the soft starter will eventually get that motor to 1,800 RPMs. Where it differs from a general starter is that a soft starter will slowly raise the voltage with its electronics. And what that does is it slowly gives the motor more and more torque and it gets up to speed. So where this is useful is fans, pumps, conveyors, anywhere where you need less than the maximum torque output that the motor can provide is it's speeding up. Okay. Specific, yeah. Well, that's, that's, uh, that's a good breakdown. So, we call this Eco SY you know, for for a reason because we, we kind of want to give our listeners the more a, a more in depth you know purpose behind the equipment that they're that they're utilizing. So why would I want to use a soft starter? I mean, typical applications. You just walk through fan pumps and conveyors. Are they the primary applications? And and just looking for more of the the why behind making the decision here. Absolutely. So. In a fan or a pump, we most often say fans and pumps for um, soft starts, but it doesn't always have to be a fan or a pump. The idea here is a soft starter provides you with a slowly increasing torque. A lot of people say that, oh, we use a soft start to limit current. Limiting current is actually a byproduct of a soft start. What you're actually going for is that reduction in torque upon startup. So if you have a fan with a belt and pulley system, the last thing you want to do in a lot of cases is have a 50 horsepower motor doing a full load start and a gigantic inertial load. It's just going to skid the belts, wear things out. The same goes for pumps. If you start pumps across a starter, um, you can get severe water hammer, and it ruins mechanics, and it, and it damages things. Where is if you have a soft starter, now that motor is slowly increasing torque, everything comes up to speed nice and smoothly. Okay. Thank you for, for walking us through that as well. And that you kind of brought up, so we talked about a couple of applications that it does make sense. We're about applications that it, it wouldn't make sense, what, what would those be? That's actually a very simple answer as well. So one good thing where you, or one reason you would never want to use a soft start is where you need to continuously vary the speed. A soft starter is only really good to start that load with an increasing torque. But once it's up to speed, it cannot vary the speed. It's always going to give out the frequency that is put into the soft start. And so if you do want to vary the speed, you would have to change the gearbox or change the motor speed. I got you. So it'd be, it would have to be a mechanically driven change at that point on that application for a speed change. Absolutely. Got you. Got you. Okay. So let's, let's talk about, all right, I've, I've determined that a soft starter is what I need for my application. Definitely want to go, go forward with it. Where do I start when sizing one up for my particular application? Well, there's, there's a couple things you want to look at. Um, the first one is the amount of starts per hour or per day, things like that. There's two main kinds of soft starts in general out there in the, in the U.S., and one of them is a solid-state unit that is fully solid-state, meaning it's running off of its electronics 100% of the time. And those units can do as many starts per hour typically as you want. Um, but the most common and less expensive soft starts actually switch over to an internal contactor once they're going. And it's a much smaller contactor because you're not trying to make and break a load under full speed. So in that case, when you're sizing it, 
you would definitely want to know how many starts per hour. Otherwise, those little electronics that are getting the motor up to speed are going to overheat. The second thing you want to know is what is your motor nameplate data? And again and again and again, the very first thing that you're ever going to want to ask for is what is the motor nameplate? Not all motors are the same. Not all motors have the same voltage, the same current, same poles, and the same speed. And these things matter to a soft start. So you absolutely have to know the current, the voltage, if there's a service factor, and how many starts per hour. Okay. You, you mentioned that, that, that contact or bypass. Is that, is that what we hear people talk about a lot of time, a soft starter with a bypass? Is that what they're asking for in that situation? So in general, you have a soft start with an internal bypass. And that just means once that soft starts up to speed, it switches over to that small contactor that we talked about, right? And then it can run all day long extremely efficiently, right? It's just a starter at that point. Um, that's sometimes what some people mean. The other way that people mean it is if they have a soft starter in a panel, and if that soft starter were to fail, they would need to fail over to a standard starter, which means just a contactor setup, right? So if the soft starter failed, they would want what's called a two-contactor bypass or a three-contactor bypass. And what that allows for you to do is to run the load and in some cases be able to replace the soft start. So if you have a load that just absolutely cannot stop for whatever reason, then you would want to have what's called a bypass system. And as a matter of fact, when you're doing drives, sometimes you actually have a soft starter bypass for the drive. Ah, uh, very good. Okay. What about protection from you know, overload, short, short circuit protection, does that scheme change with a soft start application? Yeah, so on a starter system, you're going to have your line protection, you're going to have your soft start, and then you're going to have your load, okay, or your overload. And sometimes that line protection has a motor overload built into it in a starter. Soft starts and drives are also pretty similar. In a soft start, you're going to have a line protection device, and you should always go to the manufacturer's requested line protection for that, whether it be fuses, circuit breakers, or a combination. But the soft start will always have the motor overload protection built into it, and so does a drive. But in a soft starter, you're definitely going to want to put that in because if your motor's pulling too many amps, the soft starter is then the device that's going to protect your motor. Gotcha. Very good. Thank you for, for walking us through that, Chase. Very good information there. Let's let's move to control for, for a soft starter. You know, you, you have different options for control of any a lot of these smart devices these days. How does that play into factor with soft starters? So one of the things that most people like myself would ask you or the customer in the first place is how do you want this thing to run or communicate? And what we're asking is, do you want to do hardwire control? Meaning, do you want to have I.O. running straight to the soft starter, physical 24 or 120 volt I.O. and buttons that you can push to make it go, stop, things like that. Another very popular method is to run it over the network now, right? So you can have a programmable logic controller, a PLC, run it remotely. Um, and in that case, you'd want a network control. And one of the most common networks today is Ethernet, and there's several different you know, protocols and Ethernet that people can use and that different manufacturers support. We use Profinet, but, you know, there's several others that are available too. And that would be an example of network control soft start. In addition to that, you could have it run in what we call handoff auto mode. That's a very common industry term. So off is just obviously off. And most typically hand mode is going to be those manual switches and IO points running directly to the drive with good old-fashioned MTW, and then auto would typically be a network-controlled device. Very good. I mean, that, that, that was kind of, you walked exactly where I was hoping that you would to cover all the different areas, so thank you for that control. Hopefully that brings sure. some, some, some answers, some questions for the listeners out there. Now, let's say we have this soft starter installed. We're ready to go out. We have our, our, our motor installed on the application, and we're, we're wanting to go through a startup. What does that typically look like uh, for these types of applications and devices? Sometimes it depends, or I guess it rather depends on who put it together. Sometimes the manufacturer can put that together, um, like Siemens, uh, who I work for. Um, other times it could come from a panel shop or a panel builder. And sometimes the end user can assemble it themselves or put that soft starter in a panel or it could be a wall mount unit. No matter what the situation, if you're the one starting this thing up, we always, always, always ask. It doesn't matter who made it. It doesn't matter who put it together. We always want to make sure that everybody verifies all the connections 
and verifies that the safety checks have been done. Okay. That is the most paramount is to keep everybody safe, right? When you power these things up, I always tell people, don't be anywhere near it. The very first time you power up something with a bunch of large capacitors in it, you have the potential for failure, right? So with safety being said, as always being number one, <laughs> always keep the panel closed if, you're, if it's in a panel, you know, those kinds of things. But when you do power it up and everything's okay, the first thing you want to do is you want to review the parameters. Most soft starters have a list of parameters or settings that you would go through, or they have dip switches for the more simplistic units. But make sure that those are set up properly. There's two different main modes that soft starters typically run in, and they either have um, what they call a time start. So if we have a typical 460 volt soft start, it goes from zero to 460 volts over some set time. And that voltage just increases. And the motor will pull as much current as it needs to to get to the torque that it can get to. The other way is to do what's called a current limit start. So the soft start will just manage the amount of current that it can supply the motor and vary the voltage to keep the current slowly rising. And then there's sometimes a third mode, which is an intelligent mode. But those are the two main modes. So you want to make sure that you have the right mode selected or you could have a problem. Like I said earlier, soft starts typically provide a you know, raising torque over time, but they don't always pull less current, which can be an issue um, if they're not set up right. So once you have all that set up and once you have your parameters and your system set up, the first thing you want to do is you want to do a bump test. And that's kind of how we refer to it. We make sure that the motor's spinning the right way. You don't ever want to start up a starter, a soft start, drive anything that spins a motor and tell it to go full bore in the wrong direction. Um, sometimes that can be catastrophic, right? So we want to do a small bump test, make sure that everything's going the right direction. And then we start things up, go ahead and load test it, make sure everything's running the way it should, and then, then we can go on with it. Right. Wow. I mean, you did a great job of walking us through that startup. And I really appreciate how you started us off with those areas around safety. We really stressed that on Eco S Y and tried to, to, I mean, ultimately at the end of the day, we want all of our heroes to go home, right? So uh, good point. Lo love how you walk through the different scenarios. This is kind of an off the wall question. Is there a, is there a minimum size of motor that users should think about when they consider looking at a soft starter application? I mean, I typically think of soft starters with, you know, relatively good size loads. Uh, but I didn't know was, is there a, a bottom end that you, okay, it really doesn't make sense to even think about a soft starter for typical applications. I would say no. It just depends on the load. Um, you know, if you have a very, very um, fragile load and you're trying to, like, start that load slowly, if you started with a starter, it can still break things, you know. If, you're, if your load was made out of toothpicks, for instance, and you only needed, like, a quarter horse, you don't want it to give it a quarter horse, you're going to snap everything apart, right? So soft starts, no matter what the size, can be useful. As far as sizing your soft start to the motor, every manufacturer is going to have a different size ratio that could be the maximum. So, you know, Siemens has their limitation for size of motor to soft start and so do other manufacturers. The reason that's important is because once again, the soft starter is the overload protection device. And if the current sensing devices inside of that soft starter can't accurately measure the current going to the motor, then you may not be possibly protecting your end device and that can result in problems, obviously. So there's generally a limit that you should look at your manufacturer. If I have a one horsepower motor, I may not want to go over a two horsepower, a three horsepower soft start. That makes sense. Very, very good. Thank you. Thank you for that. Cause you're right. It definitely, I guess there is no limit so far on the small, on the small end, depending on that, the right applications. And just with your experience out there, Chase, you've seen a lot of things in the industry. Obviously you work for a, a great manufacturer. You're, you're in front of a lot of customers. What mistakes have you seen users making when the, when it comes to applying a soft starter in industry or just trying to help people get better, right? So any any advice or any things you've seen that um, people could potentially learn from here? Yeah, always learn from <laughs> always learn from other people's mistakes and learn from mine, right? A soft starter got sized one time for a uh, for a very, very large fan, really high inertia we're talking. I think it was like six or seven hundred horsepower. And the soft starter was set up to do, you know, a typical soft start, which, you know, like I said earlier, raises the voltage from zero to 460 over a set amount of time. Well, 
as you can imagine, it's kind of like a brownout for a motor once you're under voltaging the motor in. So it can pull a lot of current. So in a high inertia setting, sometimes you want to set it for a current limit start instead so that you're not pulling too much current. In this particular case, the customer had been trying to start up this unit over 30 seconds. And so the motor was just pulling truckloads and truckloads of current. And eventually they blew the main breaker coming into the power building, which was pretty impressive. So they called me out there and they said, let's, let's see it again. And they started it up again. So it was about five seconds into it. And I saw the lights actually starting to dim in the room and we we just said shut it off um <laughs> so after some quick setting changes you know we put it in a current limit setting right and we set it for like 150 percent current limit and then all of a sudden the problems kind of went away so make sure you're picking the right device for your application number one and uh number two make sure that the settings are correct and you know people like us again i work for siemens you know so if you want us to come out and look at things, we're happy to do that kind of thing. So rely on your local experts. In general, we're more than happy to come out and see a new application. Absolutely. That was a great story. I was thinking back to my motor repair days. We liked it when guys did stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, uh, we'll sell you another one. Don't worry. That's right. That's <laughs> right. Well, Chase, man, thank you so much for your time today. A lot of, a lot of expertise that you dropped here, uh, a lot of knowledge. Hopefully this is a, a, a valuable piece of information for our listeners, and I really appreciate your time again. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. Eco is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit EcoSY.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.